Here. Watch out! Yes. I'm afraid that Ike was in the middle of a dreadful losing streak, and he elected to blame me for his misfortune. Poor soul. He was just too high strung. Before the war, I was an orthodontist, and while I ceased practicing, I still enjoy using the title. It lends weight to the name, don't you agree? Chess and Red Bear, are you? Many impetuous souls have pursued that rogue, and they might as well have been chasing the devil himself. However, I am loath to denounce your endeavor entirely, as Red Bear is a scoundrel of the lowest order. After all, he is just a man, and as the real Romans would say, memento mori. We ghouls are an exception, of course. As for information, you might try accosting the local viper hoodlum Slade. Firstly, congratulations on exterminating that nuisance. Like most of the raider refuse, he had little regard for decorum. He and his petty outlaws had a habit of preying on defenseless females. I simply cannot abide a man who disrespects women. However, with Slade dead, I'm afraid you're at an impasse in your search. Nevertheless, I might have a possible lead. I do know that Red Bear has extensive dealings with Mr. Norman Meston, a brutish individual who operates Shadda Company. Shadda Company is a rather shady mercenary outfit, but they manage to thrive out here on the fringes of the NCR. Only inside the bowels of a heavily guarded bunker. It's an unappealing route to Red Bear, but it's a route nonetheless. Here's a location. Meston should have documentation of his dealings with Red Bear. I'm not privy to the details, but they have been trading for at least a decade. They call them Shadow Company for a reason. It's a crude yet accurate description of their secretive nature. Various factions rely on them because they conduct all operations with the utmost confidentiality. As for Meston, I don't know much about the man other than that he has a tremendous capacity for physical violence. 
Rumor has it that the company's profits, finances, implants, and other unnatural augmentations to the body. And where you find Meston, you'll find his rabid lackey, Mr. Joshua, a vicious little cur and utterly loyal to Meston. I see I have not dissuaded you. If you manage to survive, I hope you return to the saloon and visit a bit. And one more thing. If you are going to pursue this in earnest, I'll advise you to consult with Mr. Dent, the gentleman sitting at the bar. I believe he's had dealings with Shadow Company in the past, although they were anything but amicable. Farewell, and good luck. Yes, he's a key figure in an organized crime syndicate. Supposedly, he had extensive dealings with that corpulent pervert, the judge. The prevailing rumor is that Mr. Fisk has come under significant pressure from his own superiors since you've disrupted their interests. If Mr. Fisk is removed, it will only exacerbate the power vacuum rendered by the judge's demise. I certainly wouldn't shed tears for either of those bastards, but I'll worry who might replace them. Nature abhors a vacuum. He is an ill-bred, flagitious cur bent on pillaging and destruction. Despite his bucolic origins, he possesses considerable intelligence and cunning. I saw him on one occasion in the town of Dalhart, a dusty stop over on the plains. He was trading in hides and chattel and accepted practice there. His eyes said it all. He had a stare that was more barren and dehumanized than that irritated step. He was young, but I knew what he was. He has long since been a pestilence in those parts, though I estimate he is aging by now. It's been uh, 30 years since I saw him that time. If the law doesn't catch him, then time will, my friend. I grew up before the war and was blessed with a strong upbringing and a classical education. Both have served me well in these troubled times. My father died when I was rather young, so my brother Joseph and I were close. That was a lifetime, <laughs> two lifetimes ago. Joseph was taken from me before the war. I don't normally like to speak of it, but it's been so long. Joseph was the sheriff in our hometown. What he lacked in loquacity, he made up for in decisiveness. He was an honest man, more honest than I ever was at least. He was a rock, I thought he could never die. One weekend a drifter made his way into town and for no apparent reason killed Joseph. He shot him in the back, they said. The state police eventually found the perpetrator, a man by the name of Johnny Rounder. He was tried and sentenced to death. He sat on death row for two years, and after countless appeals and delays, the execution date was finalized, October 24, 2077. It was a day too late as things turned out. The airburst over Fort Bennett produced enough radiation to kill almost everyone shortly afterwards. I watched my family wither away. My own son turning pale, his hair falling out, crying. I wanted to die with them, but I lingered on. I fell asleep next to my wife as she died and prayed to die with her. Instead, the next morning I woke up looking at Johnny Rounder. He was holding Joseph's badge, admiring it like it was a long lost trophy. He'd already changed. He just looked at me and said, Now you got something to live for, Doc, and then walked away. I've been following that bastard for 200 years, and it's going to end here. I can feel it. We've killed each other several times over, if you're measuring pain. He had experience with a pistol and was able to outdo me at first. For years, it was just a game. He laid me broken and bleeding in some remote spot. But in time, the game stopped. It was around 2190, I think we were somewhere in Texas. Some place where they still had trees near Louisiana. 
I caught him coming out of the saloon, but it wasn't some craven ambush. I looked him in the eyes first, and then I put a 357 slug in his gut. He mangled my arm and managed to get away, thanks to his gang. We faced off at least a dozen times since then, but never with any resolution. For the last few years, he's been running a gang outside the NCR and Legion's respective territories. However, with the regional power players and the judge gone, there is an opportunity for a ruthless prick like Johnny. Besides, I know how he thinks. He'll be here, sooner rather than later. If not for the power, then for me. If you ever get a lead on him, look me up. I'd do anything to give another shot at it. He's a veritable psychopath who places engraved harmonicas in the mouths of slain opponents. How he acquires such a steady supply of harmonicas and the means to engrave them is beyond me, but that is his moniker. He was born from the same putrid stock as Marco, so villainy is in his bloodlines. I was wanted for questioning in regards to a minor altercation in the adjacent territory. Randall was prompted by his employers to pursue me. Randall was very professional about the whole affair, and realizing I was a fellow Southerner, he was willing to discuss the matter. We settled it with a card game, which I handily won. Randall was a gentleman about the affair and left it at that. In case you're wondering whether I cheated, I'll say this. Any man who wouldn't cheat when gambling for his freedom is a damn fool. It's simply a shame what happened to Randall. He carried himself with a rare combination of strength and calm. He was very poised. And I can tell you that if your profession depends on using a gun, poise counts for more than anything. I never met him, but I had the chance to interact with some of his contemporaries. Whatever crimes the Enclave perpetrated, I was always impressed by their fastidious approach to oral hygiene, every last one of them. As for Captain Ribbon, I understand he assisted with horrific experiments while serving under Lieutenant Colonel Charles Curling. By all accounts, Captain Ribbon was quite enthusiastic, but uh, fortunately for all of us, some um, chosen one stopped the whole affair. I've uh, never quite fathomed the appellations in such legends. Who chose this one? I certainly didn't. Pardon me, you didn't inquire into my opinions on wasteland myths. To return to the matter at hand, I have no idea where Captain Ribbon might be. A few rumors persist, and they are dubious at best. One traveler purported that Ribbon was now a wild man in the Spring Mountains and had spawned a pack of feral orphans to do his bidding. Stranger things have happened, but I am skeptical nonetheless. In the meantime, I will drink to your success and bid you good luck in this manhunt.
what's up. I do. What's it to you? Is finding that bounty worth your life? Because going after Meston is a suicide mission. Shit, you're serious, aren't you? In that case, let me give you some details on Norman Meston and see if I can't get you to reconsider. Nobody's sure about Meston's origins, but one thing is certain. He's a warrior's warrior and runs that outfit with discipline and authority. That's why House and other prime movers rely on Meston for their dirty work. He'll always get the job done, or heads will roll, literally. As for the bunker, it's a death trap. He's got at least three dozen armed men, sentry bots, and ravenous mongrels as well. And they don't stop to ask questions either. If you step foot in their little lair, expect to be shot, burned, and mauled. I've made a living out of reading people, and I can see you're going to go through with this. The things people will do for caps. You might not want it, but here's some advice. Use a stealth boy. Get in, get the info you need, and get out. Don't dick around in there. Here, you can have this one. I haven't needed it in years. Good luck, kid. This crouch walking is hell on my back, boss.
fucking legion. I say we pay it back to those cocksuckers with interest. Throw the raiders off. No casualties. In the meantime, the troll's back. They're late. I hope they got a good excuse. What took... This is a message to the NCR from the Legion. We are coming for you. Run, and we will catch you. Hide, and we will find you. No matter what you do, you are all going to die. We took one of the women alive. Hold it right there. We've been staking out this place for two days, just waiting for Jameson and his crew to step out so we can ambush them. Then our little bounty hunter comes strolling right in as the gang commences to kill each other. Pretty fucking amazing luck if you ask me. But I don't give two shits about that bounty. Jameson had information on a stash of gold. I want it now. The name's Pullman. I'm a regulator. As the name would suggest, me and my crew are here to regulate the Mojave. It's a lawless place. 
brimming with miscreants and dregs, so there's no shortage of work for us. I'd advise you to keep going. For future reference, it's best to stay out of our way, Pilgrim. Hey. You? Are you there? Are you here for the delivery job? Come closer, please. Yes, I recognize you. A regular courier would suffice, but you... Well, this is fortuitous. You're a person of many parts, aren't you? I heard you cheated death. Left quite a mark around here. Nothing like being dug out of a shallow grave to give you perspective, eh? All this time, everything you've done, your choices, the people you've killed, you can't control that story. You may not realize it, but you're becoming the stuff of legend. Whether you like it or not, if not for my infirm condition, I'd be apt to hear your take on things. You have made your choices, seen the consequences. I did much the same long ago. In another life. I am still paying for those choices. Couriers have a special role. One of trust. I hope you will maintain that fidelity. As this delivery... It's... I can't put this off any longer. I want you to deliver a package to a man in Westside. His name is Bradley. In exchange, I will pay you five hundred caps, all up front. Consider it a gesture of goodwill and trust. Is the proposal satisfactory? As I expected, you are perfect for the job. Deliver this letter and key to Bradley a mercenary under the employ of the West Side Militia. Once the letter is delivered, you are free of any responsibility to me. However, if you elect to assist Bradley, I will be in your debt. I hope this will be an end to things. A just settlement. Good luck, courier. I would like to be alone now. What can I do for you, young man? Okay, what's the bounty? That crybaby couldn't turn himself in fast enough. Wouldn't shut up about his damn injuries. Wasn't much more than the flesh wound, really. One of the cons wouldn't have him. He was just a big pussy all along. Anyway, he got sentenced to 30 years, which means he's gonna end up somebody's bitch. It's refreshing for an old-timer like me to see these young punks brought to justice. Good work. What can I do for you, young man? Okay, what's the bounty? Ah, so you bagged old bloody Brad, did ya? I don't know who gave him that damn moniker. He probably gave it to himself. He ran a tight crew for years, but I heard he's been slipping lately. 
Rumor also has it that he knew about some stash of Legion gold. That's just a scuttlebutt, though. If the Legion loses anything, they're usually on it like white on rice. Anyway, here's the reward. Good work. What can I do for you, young man? Okay, what's the bounty? Let me see that finger. You know how Lobo got that name, right? They say when he got hopped up on Jet that he'd literally start howling at the moon. From the looks of his finger, his howling days are done. It's definitely Lobo's. Good work, kid. What can I do for you, young man? Okay, what's the bounty? Okay, here's your reward. Fucking motherfuck this place. Hey. These people have too much weaponry for their own damn good. I know Mother Pearl is letting you wander Nellis as you please, Outsider, but I have patients to tend to. I have three patients here who were gravely injured fighting those giant ants in the generator building a few days ago. I've stabilized their wounds, but they're in bad shape. Do you have medical training? If what you say is true, you can do us a world of good. Some fine doctoring. I could learn a thing or two from you. Excellent treatment. I hadn't thought of that. I thought that man was done for, but you brought him around. Yes, outsider? Those men owe you their lives. Seems we could learn a thing or two from you savages, when it comes to medicine at least. Bye. Mother Pearl's instructions are clear. You can move freely around Nellis, and artillery spotters have orders not to fire on you. These are extraordinary privileges. Don't abuse them. Long story short, the power failed a few days ago because giant ants have tunneled into the generator room and set up a nest. I led a team down to exterminate them, but there were so many of them. We lost. Two killed, three wounded. Personally, I think it's more than a savage can handle. But if you want to kill those ants and switch the power back on, feel free. Sure, anyone can. But there's more than a few down there. See for yourself. But one other thing. The ants must be eating gunpowder from the munitions down there, or something. They exploded when hit by a flamethrower. One of us was using a laser pistol. Same thing. Bullets seem okay, just don't hit the artillery shells. Loyal's been working on some kind of weapon to use against them. Maybe you should check with him. I hope Pearl knows what she's doing, letting you wander around Nellis as you please. If that's so, how about you look into repairing the solar arrays on the roof of the generator building? Nothing too complicated about it, but it's a long ways to walk my old bones, and there's been that ant problem over near there. You can't miss the array. It's on top of the generator building smack dab in the middle of Nellis between the two runways. <laughs> if we need something obliterated, Raquel and the Howitzer crews are more than qualified. No, we have more specialized issues we need help with right now. Ha! Huh. If we had spare parts, do you think I'd be asking you to fix the damn things? That's rich. No, we ran out of spares a while back, and Jack and I have been doing our best to patch the arrays up as best we can. Sadly, we're at our wit's end. There have to be spare parts somewhere around the wasteland, but...
but I just don't know where to direct you. You may have noticed we don't get out much. All right, what's on your mind? No, those aren't for outsiders to use. Leave them alone. Well, if you genuinely care so much, they're flight simulators. If you don't know our history yet, you should see Pete and get the tour. We dream to one day rule the skies. I started building a sonic emitter that might do the trick, but it's useless without knowing the exact frequency that would kill the ants. If you're willing to take the risk, be my guest. I've got it set to broadcast a powerful signal at 24,000 hertz. Just place it near their nest and cross your fingers. Signal's too high for people to hear, so no harm done. But it might make you feel sick to your stomach. Hello. That's a good thing to see, huh, boss? That loyal guy. He's getting up there in years, but he still finds a way to make himself useful to his people. If you ask me, that's better than withering away all alone or holding on to some faded piece of glory from your past. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Old history, boss. After the fire, I knew my sister and I couldn't stay at Hidalgo Ranch anymore. The refugees still wanted me dead. They even put a bounty on me. I remember how scared Rafaela was. I told her if she came with me, we'd see the vaqueros. She used to love the rodeo, especially the trick riders. We figured maybe we could find help in Mexico City. We were young. We didn't know what had happened, really. We didn't understand about the bombs. I don't think it was as hard hit as DC or Bakersfield, but it was bad enough. By the time we got there, the city was a radioactive ruin. Still, the city was full of looters already forming into the beginnings of raider tribes. Crime was bad before the war, but now it was a nightmare. We were living like scavengers, scraping by on what little food we could find, always looking for medicine for my burns. And then, of course, the radiation started to kick in, turning me into this handsome devil you see before you. You're a poet of understatement, boss. But there were moments it was almost worth it. I still remember finding that novelty costume shop. I was just looking around for something I could slice up to wrap my burns when I saw the Vaquero outfit hanging on the rack like it hadn't been touched. I took it, not like anybody else needed it, you know, and wore it back to our camp. Rafaela laughed for the first time since the bombs had fallen. It was. I started to build up a legend. Sometimes it headed off trouble, but most of the times it just started more. Young punks looking to prove themselves would come looking for me, but my eyes were sharp and my guns were quick. For a while, it seemed like we might even survive there, until... until Rafaela. She went out to find some food one day. I was sick, so I stayed at our camp. I guess it must have been the beginning of radiation poisoning. Anyway, it was supposed to be safe, but some raiders happened to pass through where she was scavenging. I won't speak of what they did to her. When I found her body, the only way to recognize her was this funny little scar on her knee from when she was a little girl. Terrible doesn't begin to cover it, boss. I led my whole family down. First the ranch, now Rafaela. I was the last Tejada. I guess maybe I went a little crazy then. I took my guns and went back to that market. I didn't have many bullets but I had enough. After the raiders were dead, I salvaged what I could from the store. I was tired. I just wanted to be alone forever. I left Mexico City behind. I made my way out to the Gulf Coast. Eventually, I found an old Petro Chico refinery nobody had claimed. I stayed there for a little while, and I thought a lot about my life. I thought about the guns I'd lived by and what they'd gotten me. I decided my guns hadn't gotten me anything and it was time to give it up. I took off the old Vaquero outfit and put on a Petro Chico jumpsuit. The name tag said Miguel, so I started using the name myself. Eventually, I made it to Arizona. 
That's all the story, boss. I guess we're doing this. I see the power's back on. The ants are all dead? Maybe Pearl is right about you. Because I don't know how you pulled that off. I'll tell Loyal to send someone down to clear out the eggs and repair the generators. Good work. Hello, outsider. Need something? An impressive piece of work. I'll keep that in mind if jobs come up in the future. Don't get blown up. You have done well to earn the trust of my people, child. I believe the time has come for you to show your value in full. The people have come to accept having you around. Find Loyal and ask him about our people's fondest dream. He will tell you what to do next. Pearl sent word saying it's all right to tell you about the lady in the water. Ain't nothing creepy about it. It's a term of respect. A long time ago, long before the war that killed just about everything that ever lived, a bomber crashed not far from here. A bomber was a flying contraption that could drop explosives down on anything it flew over. But anyway, moving on. 
This bomber crashed down in Lake Mead, pretty damn near intact. When we got to Nellis, see, I found this article in a magazine all about it. There was another B-29 around here, part of a museum. Couldn't fly, but had a lot of spare parts, see? Get where I'm going? Since I was a young man, I've dreamed of raising that lady from the lake and bringing her back to life. What do you say? It's at the bottom of Lake Mead. I'll mark its location on your Pip-Boy map. I know it does, but I tell you it ain't. I've worked it out so it's simple. Maybe you don't understand. Hasn't been one of us, not a one, to set a foot outside Nellis in over 50 years. You come along with your knowledge of the outside, and it seems the time's come to raise the lady after all. Good. Here's the deployable ballast. Go find the plane, attach the ballast, and hit the button. Might try holding your breath. If that doesn't sound good enough, talk to Jack. He was working on a rebreather once. Okay, boss. I'll just wait here, alone, while my heavily armed companion goes out of earshot. I'm sure nothing will happen. I'll be right here, Chief. I'm happy you came along. You are the answer to our dreams. It's going to be a dream come true once you've raised that bomber from Lake Mead. That's tremendous. I'll transmit instructions to the robots to start packing up the plane to bring it back to Nellis. Hey, I'd better get rolling. Jack and I have a lot of work ahead of us. Hello, friend. How can Mother Pearl be of help today? What you have done for us is a miracle, child. 
You have fulfilled the only dreams we ever had outside our walls. You are a trusted friend of us all. If there is ever a way for us to help you, child, tell me, and I will make it so. Of course, my child. After all that you have done for us, we would love to help you in the upcoming battle. After all the training and virtual reality, the young ones would relish an opportunity to put their skills to battle. We'll be there when you need us. Don't get blown up. 